This is the start of a new series where I look into the classes of D&D and Baldur's Gate 3 in a tighter spotlight. There'll be chapters below if you want to skip around, but in videos like this, we're going to go through many aspects of this subclass or class. We're going to start with the history and origins and continue practice of the class. Then we'll go through its abilities and what it can actually do inside the game. Then we'll talk about really fun subclasses and multi-classes that augment and enhance this abilities already. And then we'll talk about this class's synergy with Baldur's Gate system that they already have as far as equipment and other abilities that are not inherent to 5e and how to actually get the subclass into your game. About to jump in, but I want to let you know that we started a new live D&D show. It will be every Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific Coast time, looking at Los Angeles 5 p.m. I'll be DMing one shots to small campaigns with the goal to test out new beta material made by third parties, stuff like Ryoko's Guide to the Spirit Realms, which will be our first beta test. And all my players will be the viewers of this channel and all through the discord will vote on who gets to play and then they'll come in make characters with the new material and we'll play it live with you on 5 p.m we already have our four runners already ready to go we're going to be live together playing this game for you guys and then the next four will be announced during that game we're really excited but let's get to the video blade singers became a really quick popular subclass choice for DD wizards before tasha's was even a thing they had blade song wizards in second edition third and fourth i believe they've been throughout the history of all Faerun. they've been around for a long time and blade singers are actually brought to 5e in unearthed arcana years before the book came out so blade singing is an ancient art practiced by elven wizards it is enhanced training and also an art form at the same time that blends fluid movements from multiple different fighting styles and arcane magic at the same time. Blade singers themselves are revered as a very famous artist would, as the fighting style is depicted to them as art itself. Except for this art is strong and powerful enough to protect their community and their traditions as elves. Using his free hand, the blade singer mirrored the opponent's casting and sent considerable power out to surround the overmatched wizard, binding it to himself. Argent energy flew from the human's outstretched hand, only to fizzle into nothingness as the blade singer quenched their spell. That's a quote by somebody who saw a dope counterspell, probably. So blade singing is a tradition taught by a master to apprentice tutelage system. It's not taught into like a classroom. You don't go to blade singing academy most prominently in Telquasar of Faerun, and that's where people think it also were created, but you know, never really, no one ever really knows where things were created in Faerun. Tradition states that blade singing and its practice cannot be shared through a written format. So the only way to become a blade singer is to learn from someone who knows it. All styles are different and unique based on what master taught you it, and they're all based on a specific type of animal, one specific blade singer's form could be inspired by a cat being fast and graceful, while another blade singer's form could be inspired by a snake where they would be doing single spike attacks, stuff like that. This animal inspires them so much that most blade singers end up getting tattoos on their body to dedicate themselves to that. When groups of blade singers get together, Usually it's to defend an elven community, but that's now then called an order. And an order of blade singers is made up very specifically based on what kind of blade singers are already there. They try to make every member a different animal based style with a different weapon with different magic proficiencies. While they're all blade singing, they're all specialized in a different style. It diversifies them and makes them stronger as a unit. While fighting, a blade singer uses precise movement and magic at the same time to keep a very enhanced godlike defense. Their sword is used to both parry and attack, while their other hand is meant to be casting simultaneously while they're acting out those other actions. The blade song is referring to the sound that their weapon is making while they're spinning in the air. When they swing their sword around, the air that deflects off the blade itself creates a sound that they use to create a song with it while they're attacking. Blade singing fighting is more about movement economy and grace over brutal force. So blade song styles are inspired by animals, the oldest one being a cat type style. Lion is one of the first styles created using a long sword, while leopard styles use short swords and illusion magic, and tiger styles tend to use scimitars and lunges and wide swings. Bird styles are some of the most newest. The eagle style focuses on being fluid and using hand axes, 
and the Raven style actually uses a warp pick simultaneously with spells that increase their speed like haste. Haste, by the way, is the best spell for blade singing. Another old type of blade singing style are snake styles. Most snake styles use weapons like flails or whips. The viper style uses a poisoned covered whip that they attack with and then they use magic to also inflict diseases like bestow curse. Because of their different fighting style that combines magic, they actually ended up creating new spells to go along with it. And some of which actually made it to 5e, some of them didn't. Spells like Frostbite, Dancing Fire, Dazzling Ray, and Unseen Hand were created out of the necessity of only casting with one hand while you're fighting with another. Starting off, when you choose Bladesinger at level 2, you get a few things. Trained in Warren's Song gives you additional proficiencies, one in Light Armor, the Performance Skill, and one One-Handed Weapon. Depending on what kind of environment you're playing, this One-Handed Weapon is going to be really important. You can also choose additional races that come with other weapon proficiencies. I like to pick Gith if I'm really trying to reach out with my blade singer proficiencies as far as weapons go, as Gith come with both long swords and great swords. But my favorite race to play a blade singer is a Zariel Tiefling, hands down. They come with an upgraded, leveled version of Searing Smite, as well as getting Branding Smite at level 5 which is a great way to do radiant damage, which isn't mostly blocked, as well as having a ranged option with it. And if you wanted to go special and do ranged, I would suggest taking a drow race option, as they get proficient in one-handed crossbows. As long as it's one-handed, it's a green light. Along with the new proficiencies, we also get to invoke the blade song itself. This is invocable as long as we are not wearing medium or heavy armor, we are not using a weapon that takes two hands, and we do not have a shield. While the Blade Song is active for one whole minute, we get to add our Intelligence modifier to our AC. We get to add it to any Constitution saving throw made to maintain a spell. Our movement is increased by 10 feet, and all Acrobatics checks are made at advantage. It's a lot of stuff that makes you incredibly mobile and basically a tank. Let's say you're level 2 and you have plus 3s on both your Dex and your Intelligence. With Mage Armor casted, a level 1 spell, your AC is made to 16, and then with the Blade Song, you'll add 3 to that to make it 19. Keep the spell Shield on you, which is a level 1 Abjuration spell, to add 5 more when you're attacked with your reaction, making your AC 24 in combat. At level 5, you can add Haste to it to make it 26, and then you can find a Bracers of Defense to make it 28, and then slap on a Cloak of Protection to make it 29. <laughs> anyway, the Bladesong Wizard is very, very, very hard to hit. But for a little bit, that is basically all that's special about you. The best part, I think personally, of the Bladesong Wizard comes at level 6, when they get Extra Attack. And I didn't say that wrong. It's not Second Attack, it's a whole new one called Extra Attack. It works virtually the exact same as second attack, except for you can replace any one of those attacks with one cantrip. This is incredibly very very helpful, especially if you're messing with any kind of multi builds, using a warlock build that could use its Eldritch Blast to knock people around or bring them closer than attack, or doing like a rogue build where you can use true strike on somebody so you can sneak attack without having to set yourself up. If they're wearing metal, you could use shocking grasp and then swing at your sword right after. It's a lot of play around and it's my favorite part about the whole class, honestly. Our next song we get is at level 10 called the Song of Defense. When we take damage, we can use our reaction to spend a spell slot to reduce that damage. You can multiply whatever spell slot you spend by 5, and that'll be how much damage is reduced, therefore further making your d6 hit die wizard one of the best tanks you can. And then finally, at level 14, we get the Song of Victory. This lets us add our intelligence modifier to our damage with all of our weapon attacks, as long as the blade song is active, which it should be all the time, at least when you're fighting. I think my favorite part about D&D or Boulder's Gate 3 has to be multi-classing. I really love swapping in or out different class options to see what synergize, especially if they're classes that you think wouldn't at all. For Bladesong Wizard, there are three that I go to pretty often, and that's a subclass I like to call the Pact Singer. This is a Blade Singer Warlock mix that takes advantage of its ability to use Eldritch Blasts and melee attacks in the same turn without having to covet their bonus action. 
this does split your stats quite a bit as you're gonna have to do 16s in your intelligence you need a high charisma score and your dexterity can't be bad either so with this i would actually start my first level off with warlock taking hexblade and getting hex warrior that way you're able to do your charisma modifier for your weapon so you'll be attacking and defending yourself with both your intelligence and your charisma taking invocations that will further augment eldritch blast like agonizing strike to add your charisma modifier to the damage and either repelling or grasp of hadar to either push people away with them or yank them closer the bonus action could be really well used by using hex stacking on additional necrotic damage to every one of your hits especially since the higher levels you get you're going to get more than one Eldritch blast shot out with a single action i would build him in a way that the first level is warlock and then i would smash through wizard levels until i open up level six and wizard to get that ability and then i would spend the rest of my levels in warlock picking up my invocations and picking up pact of the blade because now you don't need to use spells like your Zariel Tiefling Searing Smite or Branding or use your first level Wrathful Smite which does come with Hexblade Warriors but now you can smite like a Paladin with Eldritch Smite the invocation open to only Pact of the Blades and use your wizard spell slots to do it. Another great option and kind of obvious when you really think about it is to multi-class it with Fighter. Taking Battlemaster can really put your Bladesinger over the edge into what I call the Spell Warrior. Solidifying my space as a tank in the group, I'll use my additional attack option to cast Blade Ward on myself, giving me resistances just in case I do get hit. All of the additional proficiencies you get from Fighter really can help you change up what kind of weapon is available to you at that time. Not to mention, all of the maneuvers available to a Battlemaster could really spice up a battle. They are, no joke, as fun as casting spells, and now you get to do both in the same turn. I would take Fighter as my first level, prioritizing intelligence and dexterity. My next two levels would go into Wizard, and then I would do Fighter levels from 2nd, 3rd, and 4th to get a feat. After that, I would prioritize all my Wizard levels, basically sprinting as fast as I can at that point to get haste. And possibly more useful in a tabletop D&D 5e setting, Mixing a rogue subclass into your blade singer is very, very, very interesting. You basically get everything that's so great about being an arcane trickster while also getting things like the auto crit an assassin gets. Because again, we're able to do a cantrip along with one of our attacks, we can do something like true strike, giving us the ability to sneak attack on our own terms. This, I feel, is a really good pair with the phantom rogue unlocked when you get to level three in rogue you're able to with whales of the grave spread around your sneak attack damage to enemies around you although this damage is necrotic so be careful if you're playing a strahd campaign this is a literal shout out to the phantom rogue i'm playing in a strahd campaign hi iron necrotic was a bad idea i told you but all the other abilities rogues get are incredibly helpful especially for a quasi tank being able to have any kind of damage that you see with uncanny dodge, use your bonus action to do one of our many cunning actions and disengage or dash around. But my favorite part about it is just being able to get expertise and additional proficiency so easy and super helpful in a 5e campaign. And it's why I have to again suggest taking a rogue level as your first level, making sure your dex and intelligence are as high as possible, 16s would be optimal and then knocking out your wizard levels immediately after. Grab rogue, get your sneak attack, then get two levels into wizard, unlock your blade song, then rogue all the way up to level four to grab your feet, and then get blade song wizard to level six as fast as possible. Then finish it all out with rogue. Most campaigns don't make it long enough for you to really get to your 10th level ability. Song of defense is really fun. It's a really great idea, but it just takes way too long to get when you're multi-classing anyway. Man, I swear, Blade Singer Wizard was supposed to be in Boulder's Gate 3. There are so many items built specifically for how this class plays, it's absolutely insane. How are you going to look at the Ring of Arcane Synergy and not immediately think of a Blade Singer? Using a cantrip on that round will let you add your spell modifier bonus to all your melee or weapon damage for the next two turns and you have a specific ability to use cantrips along with your attack. It's perfect. Matter of fact, there are three different arcane buffs that you can get from equipment that all slap onto this character very well. That would be arcane equity, 
Arcane Synergy, and Arcane Charge. Arcane Aquity is a bonus to your spell save DC and your spell attack rolls by one for every stack that you have. And you can easily get that from the Helm of Arcane Aquity, which gives you these abilities every time you hit with a weapon attack. And this item is easily found in Act 2 in the Stonemason's Guild at the back of the throne. I guess it's a throne. Kind of ahead of a table. Arcane Synergy is a buff that lets you add your spellcasting modifier to all of your weapon damage. You can get this from the said Ring of Synergy, which is a drop from a Githyanki fighter at the Kresh. Don't remember his name right now, but I know he hangs out right at the entryway, so once you're done pissing off Lacketh, you can go fight your way out, and it's very hard to miss if you're checking bodies. And then Arcane Charge is a buff that adds bonus points to your spell damage, as long as you have stacks, it is one stack for two additional points of spell damage. And you can get that from the Bided Time Robes, which is even easier found as you can find it in Act 2 at the House of Healing Morgue. At the secret door, it's like to the left of the zombies. You'll know when you see it. And Robes is what I would stick with. I would not use Light Armor as we are given the proficiency for. I feel like it's kind of a trap with our dexterity being one of our main slots and uh, mage armor being very very easily available to us it makes a lot more sense for us to just do clothing or robes warlock even comes with an invocation to let us use mage armor without having to spend a slot on it which is pretty handy especially if you don't have the mod that puts hexblade in your game and just have the blade singer if you're going to attempt to do the pact singer class the warlock and blade singer multi-class i highly suggest utilizing the gloves of dexterity or at least the headband of intellect. Although I do suggest using the gloves over the band. Using the helm of arcane equity is going to be super, super helpful. Plus the gloves give you an 18, giving you a plus four to your dex compared to a 17, giving you a plus three to your intelligence. It just evens out way easier this way. You can buy the gloves from the crush merchant in act one. Speaking of the crush, there is a merchant trying to get an egg out of there. Disregarding all that silly nonsense, you can purchase the Graceful Cloth from her, and these are a non-armor equipment that will take over your robe slot and give you plus two to your dexterity, and they stack with the Gloves of Dexterity, giving you a 20 in that slot. So you can roll out with your Pact Singer with a 20 dex, an 18 intelligence, and a 16 charisma, and just go absolutely nuts. With how things are going for Baldur's Gate 3, I pretty firmly believe that modding is going to be the future. Modding is going to help us get all the classes that we are hoping to come out and then not have to wait. They're super easy. It doesn't break the game at all, depending on the mod you choose, which I'll have a link to a very good 5e loyal Bladesinger mod in the description for you to choose. I'll also have a link showing you how to put mods onto your computer through using the Artificer mod. And if you're a console player and you're feeling a little left out, well, don't be. Because Lauren has been working on mod support for consoles for the past few months. And it should be here any moment now. So if you're brushing up and getting ready to find out what subclass you want to put into your game, drop a comment on what class that is and I might make a video out of it. Also, there is a new D&D live show that I'm starting. It's going to be really fun. I'm going to be testing out new third-party D&D modules, things like Ryoko's Guide to the Spirit Realm or Obajima Tales of the Long Grass. These beta new add-ons with PCs played by you guys. The viewers and my Discord members are going to be picked and drawn at a kind of a random lottery raffle type deal. And we're going to play that game live on YouTube every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, Los Angeles time. I hope you come and hang out, and if you want to play, you should totally submit your application. It's as easy as just commenting in a specific Discord channel, and that link will also be below. I want to thank all my sponsors, but especially these guys right here. People on the Adventurer higher tier list gets added to the ending credits of every video, as well as get added to a raffle that gets pulled every Sunday. This Sunday, I'm giving away another one of my Dice hoodies. It's one of the softest hoodies I've ever owned. I'm really stoked on it. I sell them like crazy at expos. I hope you enjoy it. All right, that's enough of me. All right, bye, I love you.